<laughs> so we have basically a unit circle universe, a universe of unit circles. Okay? And so the very first circle, the very first ring that makes up a polar graph is the unit circle. Now I'm only looking at the first quadrant, but if this has a radius of one, put a little, um, a little bracket here. So this is a, a radius of one. Then this circle here is the unit circle. Oh, a little shaky handwriting there. Unit circle. And I mentioned last time that if you know your unit circle trig, then you really have everything you need in order to plot points in a polar coordinate system, right? Now, just for clarity, the unit circle in rectangular points is x squared plus y squared is equal to one, all right? In polar coordinates, all right, rectangular, all right, in polar coordinates, the unit circle is just r equals one. And the reason that's the case is because we're defining graphs based off of the radius value, all right? The radius dictates the, the nature of the function. So what this is saying is r is equal to one regardless of what the angle is. So that means that it has to go out one unit in every direction, and that, that would give us the path of a circle, right? But we want to be able to uh, make this work with not just a radius of one, right? So I created this little point here, just kind of floating out in space, right? That point in a rectangular coordinate system. Now, when I say rectangular, I'm talking about XY, an XY plane. Um, we call it rectangular because depending on how you scale your horizontal and vertical axis, the movements are rectangles, but if you scale it so that uh, it's consistent, meaning every unit on the x-axis corresponds to a unit on the y-axis. So if I'm letting every tick mark be two units on the x-axis and I do the same for y, then the movement to plot a point will be in the path of a square. All right, so over, up, same distance, all right? But if I let the x-axis be worth one unit and the y-axis is worth two units, then when I'm plotting points, it's going to be a rectangular movement, all right? So I have this point here floating out in space. That's x, y, or we could say r theta. But we need a, we need a way to get from one form to the other, all right? So I'm going to take what I know about the unit circle. All right, so x squared plus y squared is equal to one. All right, in that unit circle, x is equal to cosine of theta and y is equal to the sine of theta. And it's from that that we get our Pythagorean identity. All right, now, if I want X to be scaled, Y to be scaled, uh, we would have to change the radius of the circle, all right? So if I make it X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared, all right? So really the one is a one squared. Uh, the, the more general form, it's actually, I should say standard, I should use the right terminology, uh, standard form of a circle, is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Now this is particularly the case, I'm trying to get that power of two in there. I kind of put a little too much flourish on my of, all right? Standard form of a circle centered at the origin, all right? So that's something to keep in mind. Later on in the unit, we'll talk more about other types of circles that have centers elsewhere and how that works, but this is what we're really looking at in terms of, um, you know, just unit circle related stuff. Now, in this instance, X is equal to R cosine theta and Y is equal to R sine theta. 
All right. So when you scale up anything and any figure, you multiply whatever the oh, hold on, I got some here. Wait, I don't admit. All right. Uh, when you when you take a geometric figure, let's say x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Make a little tiny one here. Radius of one. It's part of the unit circle. You have x and y. If you want to scale that up. So that the hypotenuse is now R, you have to do the same thing with the horizontal component, all right? So R times X, and you have to do the same thing with the vertical component. So R times Y. And so just to be uh, more clear about it, I'm gonna change a color here. I'm gonna make this one an R in green. And that one became an R because we took R and multiplied it by one. So we're multiplying R by every dimension in whatever, you know, whatever the figure is. In this case, it's a it's a triangle, right? But when you when you're looking or working with similar triangles, that's that's kind of how it works. I mean, it's it's also it works that way for pentagons and other types of uh, polygons. Right? So all you're doing is scaling it up. So in the, in this case, if I know X is equal to cosine of theta and I need Rx, then I would multiply cosine theta by R. Right? So in this new universe, this polar coordinate system, X would now be R cosine theta and Y would be R sine theta. Right? And you can, you can actually prove it by plugging it into the, um, the standard form of a circle formula and it checks out, right? And if that's something you're interested in, right? Now, I could also go the other way and use our knowledge of these formulas because I have two, two formulas, X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta, that takes us from polar coordinates into rectangular coordinates. The result is X and Y. All right, but if I want to go the other way, I have a bunch of different possibilities that I can I can use. All right, so if I solve this equation here for cosine, I get cosine theta. I'll go back to uh, black here. Cosine theta is equal to x over r. Sine of theta is equal to y over r. All right. If I solve these for theta, I would do that by taking the inverse cosine of both sides. All right. So the inverse cosine of both sides would give us a result of theta is equal to the inverse cosine. So I'll say arc cosine of x over r. So if I know the x value and the radius, then I'll be able to figure out the theta value. Same idea with the sine of theta, right? Theta would be equal to the arc sine of y over r. The issue that we run into here is we would need to know the r value. Now, if I'm given coordinates that are just made up of x and y values, then I'm like, all right, well, I need the r, so how do I figure it out? I can do that by solving this equation, or if I go back to my uh, triangle here, if I'm assuming this is theta, right, the opposite over hypotenuse, you know, the y over the r, r y over r r one. But if I want to do um, a tangent, tangent would be opposite over adjacent. All right, that incorporates the y value. All right, so I'd be looking at another formula. So I'll just jot it down up here. Tangent of theta is equal to y over x, which means that theta is equal to the arctan of y over x, All right? This is a really good formula to help figure out the theta value when you know the x and y values only. If you know the r value, then you can use any of the three, All right? You can use arc sine, arc cosine, or arc tangent. 
right? Also, also, if I solve this one for R, I get R is equal to, I'm just taking the square root of both sides, equal to the square root of X squared plus Y squared. Now, technically plus or minus, but if I'm plotting a circle, it really doesn't matter in which direction. Well, most of the time it doesn't matter which direction I draw the circle in. If I know I have a circle center at the origin and a radius of one, I can draw it this way. Or I could draw it this way. Ultimately, I'm going to get the same circle. All right. So it doesn't make a difference. All right. But technically, in the interest of being as correct as possible, it would be plus or minus. But I'm just saying that in most cases, we're going to disregard the minus. All right. So in this mess here, we have formulas that help us go from one type of coordinates to another. All right. So this one is saying find the exact rectangular coordinates of each given point. So they're giving me R and theta. So I want a formula or set of formulas that are going to help me figure out X and Y. All right. And the formulas I'm going to use are X is equal to R cosine theta. And Y is equal to R sine of theta. It's all, it's all unit circle trick. Because if I know what the, the sine and cosine are of 270, I have it. So I'm going to make my substitutions. X is equal to 3 cosine 270. Y is equal to 3 sine of 270. Unit as in unit circle, as in the unit circle is a very important thing to know about in pre-calculus and further into calculus. Unit is the first word of the day, unit. We are also in the third unit, also known as the last unit. Again, unit, first word of the day, right? So cosine of 270, now again, we gotten used to the, the NumWorks calculator, but you do want to get to know your unit circle because you're going to find, I mean, again, don't know what classes you're taking after this, but you you might find yourself in a situation where the teacher is like, what are you doing with the graphing calculator? Can't use that. Right? And also, sometimes you just want to be able to get the answer quickly. Right? So there's that. And sometimes... You don't really have the time, you know, because really we're looking in this course, we work on, you know, kind of like disconnected topics. They're, they're all part of a, a, a grand tapestry of math, but you don't really see that until you get further into the studies of calculus, linear algebra and all that. Right. So this concept at some point down the line is going to be just the smallest step in a very larger process, right? a, a much larger process. So you'll have, you know, like a, a 30 step method that you'll need to use to solve an equation, or not solve an equation, solve a problem, I should say. And one minor detail is gonna be all this stuff. I mean, it, like if you gotta whip the calculator out for every little thing, you're, you're just not gonna have enough time, right? So cosine of 270, that's my motivational speak, speech for the evening on unit circle. Uh, cosine of 270 is zero. So three times zero is my X value. So zero. Sine of 270 is negative one. So the Y value is equal to negative three, three times negative one, negative three. All right, so my coordinates would be zero, negative three. And I put a little grid at the bottom here. What I did was I took the polar coordinate system and overlaid it with uh, X, Y axis. And it's one of my uh, finer achievements. So if I plot three, 270, so here's 270. I'll go back to the solution in a second. 270 is here, you know, you got zero here, 90, 180. 
And when I'm plotting three two seventy, that means I'm standing at the pole, standing right in the middle here, and I'm looking at two seventy. I'm going to take three steps towards that. One, two, three, right here. All right, that's the coordinates three two seventy. Now, if you kind of blur your vision and sort of ignore the polar part of the graph and just look at the rectangular parts. All right, you see that it's three steps down on the y-axis. So that's coordinates negative three. If you have the ability to, to plot the points, you might be able to get the answer that way. But I find that that really is most beneficial only when dealing with uh, the clean coordinates. All right, so plotting along an axis, you know, x, y axis. All right, so you know, take it with a grain of salt, but that's um, that's one of the ways in which you could figure out the relationship. Um, number two, now I'll, I'll plot it first on that grid down below. Negative uh, five pi over six, that, that's coterminal with seven pi over six. All right, all you do to get that is you take two pi and subtract from it five pi over six. Same idea as taking uh, negative five pi over six and adding to it two pi, either way. But it gives you a coterminal. So this is the same as plotting negative two comma seven pi over six. All right, so seven pi over six is down here. And again, it extends the other way. All right, so I'm standing at the pole. I'm looking at seven pi over six. I'm gonna take two steps in the opposite direction. So this point here would be negative two comma negative five pi over six. I'm labeling it with the original coordinates. But, but you have really four different ways in which you could name coordinates. You could name it with a positive R, negative R, positive theta, negative theta. So a bunch of different ways. And it, in fact, in this case, the most concise way of naming this point would probably be two comma pi over six. All right. We generally want to have the labels be as positive as possible, but you know, it's, it's not always the easiest thing in the world to figure out. All right. But you can actually name any coordinate in the polar coordinate system using only positive numbers. That's uh, pretty useful. Now, I do need to get this as a set of ordered pairs in the XY coordinate system. But looking at my graph, I feel like that's probably over two up one. So if I had to take a guess, this would translate to two comma one, right? So I get it from the graph. But I'm gonna use the process, x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta. So negative two, I'll go off the original, cosine negative five pi over six. Let me move the Y stuff over a little bit. Negative two sine of negative five pi over six. So cosine of negative five pi over six, again, it's the same thing as um, seven pi over six, All right? So cosine at seven pi over six is radical three over two, but negative. So negative two times negative radical three over two, right? So that ends up being radical three. So I suspected that it was two. I wasn't really that far off because radical three is in the neighborhood of two. It's about 1.7-ish, right? For the other one, negative two times the sine at seven pi over six is negative one half. So it's right about the one, all right? Because negative two times negative one half is equal to one, all right? So my coordinates here 
would be radical three comma one. So the graph will help us get kind of a ballpark estimate of what the coordinates would be, but you know it's not always going to be as precise as we want, right? Um, I haven't explored this calculator enough to know whether it'll convert from one to another for you. I know the old TIs did. Let me just check in the, um, the old toolbox and see if there's anything I might find useful. I feel like they just chuck everything in calculus. Nah, it's not there. It wouldn't be complex numbers, but I'll take a look anyway. Probability, definitely not. Units and constants. Mass and area. Some stuff that I didn't even know was in here, so that's kind of nice. Oh, wait, other units. Let me see that. Nope. So it looks like at this point, we're just kind of going with, we'll try trig. Nope. Arithmetic, definitely not. No. And you know, sometimes they, with the updates, they incorporate new things. So you never know, like it might not be in the app, in an app now, but in like two weeks, it mysteriously it like comes out of nowhere. You're like, oh, I didn't even know this was here. That's because it wasn't. Now going the other way, zero negative seven, I can learn from what I did in number one and just jump right to the answer. In polar form, that's gonna be seven units, seven steps towards 270 degrees. Right. Why? Because three comma 270 gave me zero negative three, the 270 accounting for the zero. The negative three coming from the fact that it's going down three units. Right? So down towards 270 degrees, three units. But you could also, right, we got to learn how to solve it anyway, use these formulas. R is equal to the square root of X squared plus Y squared. And theta, we're going to use the arctan of y over x. And since we have the calculator at our disposal, really could go either way, All right? So zero squared plus negative seven squared under a radical, clean it up, you get radical 49, which is seven. And like I said before, we could represent any polar coordinate coordinates with only positive values. So that's that's what our ultimate goal is, right? So arc 10, y is negative seven, x is zero. Now arc 10, so shift 10, I'll put negative seven over zero, it says undefined, right? It's not undefined. Right, because you can have instances where tangent is actually undefined. Any instance where the x value is equal to zero, the calculator can't get past. It's very out. It's all algorithms. It can't get past the y over x. It tries to figure that out first, and then it breaks the basically breaks the program. Right? It says, "Well, it, it can't work because you got undefined. There's no way. There's no condition in there uh, stored to allow arc tan to evaluate an undefined value." Um, also, something else to keep in mind, there's two instances where arctangent is undefined. I'm sorry, where tangent is undefined. That would be at 90 degrees and also at 270 degrees, right? Because at 90 degrees, the coordinates are 0, 1, all right? Tangent is equal to the y value over the x value, 1 over 0. At 270, assuming unit circle, so I should be clear about that. We're still talking unit circle, right? At 270, it's zero negative one, also undefined, right? So if you get a result for the arc tan that's undefined, you know it's got to be on the y axis. All right. That being said, hopefully looking at the coordinate zero negative seven, you're like, that's on the y-axis, 
right? So the possibilities are 90 and 270. Well, I'm going down. Down is towards 270. So this has to be 270 degrees. Usually when you're living along the axes, X and Y axes, it's kind of easier to figure out different relationships, but uh, but with tangent, it can be a little trickier. All right. We use the same formulas for the next one. Probably going to crash on me now. Oh, maybe not. Look at that. Got a little reprieve. I'm sure, it'll crash at some point. Uh, so again, these are our X and Y values. I can plot two comma two radical three. It's going to be a decimal value, two comma like 3.4. One, two, three, yeah, somewhere in this neighborhood. And then if you can, if you could pick it off the graph, that's great. But we want to be able, so this is two comma two radical three. We want to be able to use the formulas. And also, you know, you might look at it and say, well, it's really easy to do it on the graph, or maybe it's not easy. I don't know. It depends on preference. Uh, but you, we're going to need to use these rules to, to transform entire equations, right? So it's not just going to be limited to coordinates, All right? So 2 squared plus 2 rad 3 squared. So that's 4 plus uh, 4 times 3 is 12. Square root of 16 is going to be four. All right, so that's four rings. That looks like the point I plotted looks like it's one, two, three, four rings away from the the uh, the origin or the pole. Arctan of y over x, two radical three over two. So that's the same as saying arctan of rad three. Now, you'd be forgiven if you didn't know that that was pi over three or 60 degrees. When they don't give you instructions, you can go in whatever form you want. They said that we want theta to be as a degree. So even though I'm used to doing pi over three, I would convert that to 60 degrees. Now, how do we get that from the calculator? Shift, tan, I'll put in just the radical three, the simplified form. And it tells us pi over three. I'm in radian mode, so it, it gives us the radian form. But if we put it in degree mode, you still have to rerun the computation but it'll tell you it's 60 degrees. Like I said, the only weird ones are along the axes, right? Everything else should come out pretty cleanly. So coordinates would be four comma 60 degrees. All right, so that's how you plot polar coordinates. Now, if you extend this up into three dimensions, you know, so polar coordinate system with, with height, you get, what are called cylindrical coordinates, right? So that, that's one way to extend into the third dimension. If we have length, width, and height with rectangular coordinates, the way the axis would look would be, so in three dimensions, if I had coordinates, let's say one, two, three, I'd have an a vertical axis, a horizontal axis, and then another kind of axis, right? That third dimension. And, and it gets a little mind bendy because this axis is kind of pointing out the page on, uh, out of the page towards you. It's just, you don't really um, see it right away because it's, it's, it's a perspective drawing. Right. But if I plotted a point here, this would be my x-axis. This would be my y-axis. If I wanted to plot one, two, three, I'd go out one unit on the x-axis, two units on the y-axis, 
So that would give me a point somewhere over here and then give it some height. So I'd go up three units. So you'd have some point in space. So three units from this point, which is on a flat plane. So this plane here is the XY plane. We'd go up three units from there. So you'd have some point just kind of floating out in space here, All right? Now, I'm not gonna ask you to do that. That's more for a different course. But what I'm trying to explain here is you have some height that we'll call the z-axis. What I'm saying is this polar coordinate system could be the basis of your two-dimensional plane. You could have a polar coordinate system down here where you'd have to go out uh, four units in the direction of pi over two and then give it some height. And so this is really, you know, trying to get across the, uh, the value of this concept. I mentioned last time that I would talk to you about um graphical displays uh online graphical displays just because they're really helpful in, in in visualizing this stuff so let me actually take a minute and do that now get safari up wow there's a lot of stuff on eigenvalues here i don't even remember doing that um so there's a, a an app or software called GeoGebra. Oh, well, that's annoying. Hold on. All right, I'm just going to power through it. All right, so GeoGebra.org. They have different types of calculators here. It's kind of like, uh, if you're familiar with Desmos, it's kind of like that, just a little clunkier. Right? It, it, it has some quirks to it, but it, it does a lot of good stuff in three dimensions. So I'm going to go to the 3D calculator. So this is what I was talking about when I was saying that you'd have coordinates in the X, Y plane, and then you'd have height. So this is what the XY plane looks like if you have a top-down view in a three-dimensional system, all right? So the red one is the X-axis, the green one is the, the Y-axis, negatives to the left, positive to the right, negative down, positive up, right? This is what you would have if you were in a 3D system and looking down on the XY or ordinary Cartesian plane, all right? Now, if I change the... I guess, affect, I can get, I can incorporate that z-axis, which is the blue. So when I plotted one, two, three, this is what I would get as a result, right? So it doesn't really seem like much at first, but that's a point that's floating in space. If I go back to my top-down view, see here just trying to get the orientation right that's best i can do if if you go back to the top down view it's not going to stop me from tinkering with it you can see that this looks very much like the coordinates one comma two all right one comma two over one up two but there's a height value of three which is now more apparent when you look at the xy plane from a horizontal perspective all right. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm when I say plot in space. Right. And what I'm also saying is that if you have polar coordinates, you could have your instead of an X, Y plane, you have R theta. Right. All those rings. You would be going out, let's say four units in the direction of pi over six. I think that was the, the last answer that we had. And then going up some distance. So this gray plane that I'm showing you here, just imagine that that's a, a polar coordinate system. Um, speaking of which, you could actually do polar coordinates in GeoGebra, but I find it's a little easier to do it in Desmos.
So you could use this to kind of supplement what we do with um, with NumWorks. But if you if you go to Desmos, and if you don't have a Desmos account and you plan on continuing with math, you, you probably want to get one because it's pretty powerful software. Same thing with GeoGebra. Uh, but if I hit on this little wrench here, I could change my coordinate system so that it's polar. So if I want to plot a point, uh, you know, just making sure I'm in the right form, radians versus degrees. Oh, you know, that's weird. I thought it would do it. Hold on. Might be misremembering. Yeah, so it's plotting it in rectangular coordinates. I'm trying to remember. No. Let me try the, I might have to put it in radian. I over. No, that's not right. I'll have to think, I'll have to think about this. I, I used to know how to do it. I'm just drawing a blank for some reason. Um, let me just Google it. Plot, polar, Desmos. Polar coordinates. It's weird. It seems like it doesn't want to do just the coordinates, that it only wants to do the equations. But while I'm here, I can actually talk to you about that. Because on the next page, we get into plotting equations. So if I have something like R equals, well, the, the unit circle R equals one, it'll plot it, all right? It plots it pretty easily, all right? If I have something like R is equal to, uh, let's say, 2.5, you know, radius of 2.5. But we're, we have other types of functions that we're going to need to know how to plot, all right? So that that makes it a little juicier. But we'll come back to this. So, I'm kind of disappointed in the whole um, not being able to plot coordinate values. It's just so strange. I don't know why this happened. I want to go that way. And bring the numworks back in. All right. So I gave you a sense of how you would plot something like R equals three. I did it with R equals 2.5, but it's the same general idea. If I want to plot R equals three, that means it doesn't matter what theta is. So I'll say for all theta, doesn't matter what theta is, R is always going to be equal to three. So if theta is zero degrees, I'd go one, two, three steps in, in the, the direction of zero. If it's 15 degrees, three steps in direction of 15. If it's 16 degrees, if it's uh, 35 degrees and so on, it doesn't matter where you go, you're always going to end up on that third ring. So following that path gets me to this without the shading. And that would be my R equals three, right? Now, depending on what you're using this information for, and that's it's an important distinction. You may want to restrict the domain. Like, for example, R equals three is generating the path. That's three units. Once you complete one loop, you're done. But technically, when I write R equals three, it's going to allow for theta to be 365 degrees, 700 degrees, 1400 degrees. It doesn't really matter. It's going to keep. So what, what happens when I plot this? is that it starts here, goes around and keeps going around, 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 around like Superman one, right? You know, time reverses and all that stuff, right? So what we really want when we plot a circle is we wanna say R equals three, but only in the condition where theta is between zero and two pi or 360 degrees. All right, we have to be aware of that stipulation, otherwise it goes on forever.
Now for number six, now it says theta is equal to three pi over, uh, over four, right? So that's for all R values. So if R is equal to one, three pi over four is over here. I would take one step towards three pi over four, maybe two steps, maybe three steps, four steps, five steps, 5.1 steps, right? Maybe I didn't take any steps at all. Or maybe I took negative one step. So I took a step backwards and another, and another step and another step and another step and everything in between. So what we end up with actually appears like a line. It's not really a line. That's the thing when you're dealing with circular coordinates, polar coordinates, circular coordinates. What seems like a line is hardly ever a line. Right. And that's because. If you think of this as a top-down view of planet Earth, as in you're looking down on the North Pole, and you can see the horizontal and the verticals, like the horizontal rings and those, those vertical lines that, you know, they go off in every, every possible angle. So it depends on your perspective on what you call a vertical. But you see all those lines. They're not really lines. Because if you imagine following that longitude, Following that line, that red line, which corresponds to the longitude, and if you're looking down on the North Pole, that would go around the surface of the Earth and come around, swing back the other side, right? So in the case of a sphere, I'll just plot a sphere really quickly. GeoGebra 3D. I'll just plot a, a simple sphere, x squared plus, I don't want to recover changes, plus y squared plus z squared equals, I'll say, 3 squared. All right, so this is what a sphere would look like. Top-down view on the sphere looks like an ordinary circle, all right? But if I have latitudes and longitudes, so I'm gonna actually just bring this into our notes. If I have latitudes and longitudes, because it's a circular system, we know that if I'm traveling along the surface, I'm not traveling in a linear pattern. Copy, delete. So, Paste. Here's my sphere. You would have different latitudes. Well, oh, that's not a good color at all. I'll go with blue. Latitudes. You'd have longitudes, go back to green for that. And so on, I'll just do a couple more. All right, these green lines, air quotes lines that I drew, they're not really lines because we know that it has to wrap around the the, um, the surface of the uh, the sphere, but it's, it's gonna end up circling around back the other way, All right? So it's good to have some visual sense of what's really going on in, in the sense of, um, you know, just in a two-dimensional system, it actually would plot out a line when you plot theta equals three pi over four. But most of the time when we work with this, we're working with it not just in a two-dimensional sense, right? So we expand out to three dimensions. So I, I wanted to give you a little taste of that, right? Just so you're not shocked when you see it down the line. You're like, he didn't cover this in pre-calc. I don't know what the heck this teacher is talking about, right? So that's that. Now, other equations, R equals one half cosine theta. I mean, you could use graphing technology to help you out, but what I prefer to do, and this is what I'm going to ask you to do, is 
make a table of value. We're going right back to like beginning algebra where we made a table of values to plot points and we drew a line, right? Then uh, you moved on to parabolas. You know, you plotted seven points connected with a smooth curve. One of them would have to be the vertex. Same idea here, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a table containing only the special coordinates, right? So our independent variable is theta, our dependent variable is R, which can be a little confusing because when we plot points, we plot the R comma theta. All right. So R is your first component. It's your first coordinate. And then we, we list what the theta values are. But we actually, when we're plotting points, we really kind of need to know what the angle is first before we plot, right? So it's kind of like a uh, kind of a confused approach. Approach, approach, like as in a confused approach, approach. When we learn about limits, we talk about approaching particular values, right? Approach is the second word of the day approach All right so my nice values around the unit circle are any anything you know 30 15 15 30 as you work your way around so you have 30 45 60 90 and so on 120 135 150 180 and so on 210 225 240 270 300 315 330 and 360 right? So what we do is we start off with any nice value for cosine, right? So you think about the nice ones related to the cosine function, right? Cosine of 30, well, that's radical three over two. How, do you define that as nice? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, right? So I'm, I'm going to say that's not nice. My first nice value after zero for cosine is 60. Then after that, 90, 120, 180. Then we stop, we stop at that point. We just kind of pause and think about what we have. All right. Um, how do I know these values? Well, knowing the unit circle really helps. The X values at these angles are all clean numbers. All right either zero, one, negative one, or one half, or, or negative one half, all right? None of the radical three over twos, radical two over twos, none of that's in there. Cosine of zero is equal to one. So this is one half times one. So my R value is one half, and my theta value is uh, zero, zero degrees, all right? Again, the coefficient, is one half, 60 degrees cosine of 60 is one half. So one fourth comma 60 degrees. Every one of these values because of this one half here is gonna have a one half multiplier. Cosine of 90 is zero. So zero steps towards 90 degrees. 120 is negative one half. So negative one fourth, 120 degrees. And then 180, cosine of 180 is equal to negative one. So negative one half in the direction of 180, which is really, you know, the way of saying it's, it's actually not in the direction of 180, it's the opposite direction, All right? Now we can scale our graph any way we want, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let, because I have some quarter values here, I'm going to let four rings be one unit. All right. So then we increment based off of the relationship between the radius value and one. All right. Half of one means half of the four units. One half unit, one half quote unquote units in the direction of zero would be two rings based off of this scale, all right? One quarter would be one ring 
based off the scale in the direction of 60. Then we have zero in the direction of 90. All right, zero steps means you're at the pole. It doesn't matter what the direction is. Then we have negative one quarter in the direction of 120. So I'm standing at the pole, I'm looking at 120. I'm gonna go one ring away from that. So it's gonna put me one ring towards 300. Then the last one that I have is half of a unit in the direction of 180, which means I'm standing at the pole, looking at 180, and moving half a unit away from it. So that would be two rings in a direction of zero, which I already have. Right. So I have a couple of points here. If I connect them, it's a, a circular coordinate system, so everything should be curved. Right? There are some ex exceptions to that, but it's a good standard rule of thumb. Right. If I want to somehow grab that last point, it's probably going to look something like this. Right. Now, if you smooth it out, it looks more circular, but it, you know, it could be an ellipse. But if I look at this as okay, well, suppose it is a circle, the center would be there. It looks like we have equal distance going in this direction and this direction. That could be the same as going in this direction and this direction. So I suspect that this is a circle. Right now, if you're not sure, go to the grapher, add an element, type in your equation. This was one half cosine theta. I'm going to chuck in a one half. Well, that's not the way I wanted to do that. Let me get rid of that. I'll just kind of do it separately. So if you hit the XNT key in, in this concept, uh, con text it's going to bring up a theta but if you keep hitting it it'll alternate it'll cycle through the different possibilities we want a theta All right if i plot the graph i get a circle so you could do it that way knowing what you're supposed to get really helpful um the table can be kind of a disaster you go in there you're like uh huh well i got a clean one here that's a clean one and then since it's going by integer values i gotta go up to 360 i'd have to change my interval it's kind of a mess so we tend to go with just an ordinary table and then use that to to draw whatever conclusion in terms of what what, what shape it's supposed to be All right now it's not always the case where the pattern becomes apparent after plotting only five points you may have to plot like 10 points 15 points All right so you just got to kind of grin and bear it when you when you're doing stuff like this all right um for something like number eight uh, i would want to solve it for r first so r is equal to negative five sine of theta all right so i'm going to do my table of values again I'm looking for nice, convenient values for sine. Zero is always going to be convenient. Then 30, 90, 150, 180. And if we have to go further, we'll go further, you know? So you just kind of do a few, see if the pattern emerges, and then go from there. Right? The multiplier in each case here is going to be negative five. So I'm just going to pop that in right away. away as in right away away like i plan on going away this summer away is the third word of the day i'm just cranking them out tonight i plan on getting one more in so be on the listen all right so sine of zero is zero. So we have zero steps in the direction of zero degrees. Sine of 30 is a half. So that's negative two and a half steps in the direction of 30 degrees. 
90, sine of 90 is one. So negative five steps in the direction of 90, which again is kind of like a misnomer. You're not really going in the direction of 90 if it's negative, if the, if the R value is negative, you're actually going in the opposite direction. Uh, one half is the sine of 150. So negative two and a half, 150 degrees. And back to the x-axis, if we we're in the uh, rectangular coordinate system, uh, sine of 180 is zero. So zero steps in the direction of 180. Anytime it's zero steps, it's at the pole, all right? So I'm starting off at the pole for this coordinate and I'm gonna end at the pole. That sounds like we're gonna complete a loop, which is good, all right? Negative 2.5 means that I'm looking along the 30 degree angle and I'm gonna take two and a half steps backwards, all right? So that's gonna be one, two, it's gonna put me right here. I didn't scale this one because the coefficient is five. And from the previous one, it seems like the coefficient corresponds with the radius, all right? So the radius of the circle. Maybe this is a circle, maybe it isn't, we'll see, but that's all we have to go by at this point. Negative 590 means five steps away from 90. One, two, three, four, five, puts me right here. Negative two and a half steps away from 150. One, two and a half is gonna put me along this. And then back to zero, 180. Now, again, if you don't see the pattern, I mean, it's kind of hard to, I mean, the best pattern I could see here is, oh, okay, it looks like an arrow. That's that's not what it is, right? I need to be able to go through these points and pick up this point. If you don't see the pattern, then you might want to grab a couple more points, even if they are decimal values, right? So let, let me go to my calculation app, and I'll just chuck in a few more, like uh, kind of in the middle here. I'll go with 45 degrees, right? So for this, I'd use the calculator, negative five sine 45. That gives me about negative three and a half. Negative 3.5-ish. So I'm standing at 45, uh, at the pole looking at 45. I'm going to go the opposite direction, one, two, three, point five-ish. You know, it gets me another point there, right? Maybe I'll do um, 135. That should give me the same thing. So I take one, two, three point five ish in the opposite direction of 135. And it gives me a couple more points to work with. So I now know it has to go through these. And if I assume it's picking up the other one, this is probably the worst circle I've ever drawn in my life, but it would look something like this. All right. Now, if you put it in, in, in num works, it's going to give, it's going to give you that graph. So, you know, rest assured, you know, I'm not making stuff up. It really is supposed to be a circle, but, um, but, you know, it's kind of like, especially when you see in the graph grid, you see like examples of perfect looking circles. Uh, it's kind of hard to look at this and say, well, that green thing, that green blobby mess that you have out there, that's clearly a circle. You know, it doesn't feel that way. Now, another thing that you could do to get a sense of the shape would be to convert this over into rectangular coordinates, which is another topic that we have to talk about. But I wanted to do one more, an instance where it's a little, little kookier, all right? So number nine, I'm going to put a star on. We'll save that to get us started next time. But I'm looking at you, number 10. Look at that beast. Same idea, table of values. But the issue with this is there is no coordinate that's nice for cosine. Aside from along your axes, your x, y axes, um, there's no other coordinates that are nice for both sine and cosine. So a little trick here involves one of our Pythagorean identities. We know that cosine squared is the same as one minus sine squared.
Now, if your first reaction to me saying that is we do, we do know that. When do we know that? That was in the identities part of the last unit. Okay, so it was, it's there. It's on that identity identities page uh, that we talked about. Uh, and I, I suggested that you try to commit some of that to memory. This is kind of like part of the payoff for that. If I distribute and combine terms, I'm going to get two minus two sine squared theta minus three sine squared theta. I'm going to clean all this up in a minute which gives us two minus five sine squared theta. I just kind of chuck it in over here, put a little arrow. All right, so I'd get a new equation but a, an equivalent equation of R equals big old square root that I'll get in there in a second, six over two minus five sine squared theta. All right, now we don't have to worry about the nice coordinates versus not nice coordinates. By making that conversion, I can now work with just the nice coordinates for, co uh, for sine. If I change the sine squared into one minus cosine squared, same deal. It's just I would be looking for nice coordinates related to cosine. All right. So starting with zero and going 30, 90, 150, 180. And bearing in mind, you know, you might have to go further, you might have to fill in the gaps. Get some ugly decimals in here, but we'll start off with at least the nice, the nicest values that we could find. All right now, you'd be, it would be understandable if you're like, uh, I'm just going to put this in the calculator and see. But you don't want to, you don't want to give away the easy stuff. All right, if I put in a zero for sine, this part's going to zero out. You're going to be left with a six over two. Square root of six over two is really the same thing as the square root of three. All right, but maybe you don't see that. Two minus five sine, back it up to put the power of two in there, squared. And I'm starting with zero degrees. I'm in degree mode. So it gives, gives you know, flat out the radical three. But it also gives me a decimal approximation. So radical three, zero is my first coordinate. I don't know how far away from the ax, uh, the pole I'm going to have to get. So I tend to do a few calculations first before I start plotting points. Because that last thing I ever want to find out is that, all right, I plotted 10 points. The 11th one goes off the grid and it's like, ah, I should have scaled it. All right. So putting in the 30, just a matter of calling up the previous computation and tucking in a three in front of the zero. Two radical two, got some clean values to write, but we also have the decimal approximations to help us plot, all right? Then 90, you could do it. I mean, if you just want to continue doing it this way, you can. It says non-real, right? So we just want to make sure that what they're saying is non-real is really non-real, right? If I put in a 90, I'm going to get a one for the sine of 90. Five times one is five. Two minus five is negative three. Six divided by three is negative two under a radical. So in this case, they're right in saying that, it, that there's no answer for that. So we ditch the 90. 150. Two radical two again. So two radical two in the direction of 150 degrees. 180. Back to a radical three. So radical three in the, in the direction of 180. Now two radical two is about 2.8. I haven't seen any evidence that we're gonna go very much larger than that 
neck of the woods. So I'm fine with leaving this as an ordinary scale. All right, so 2.8-ish, again, are the two radical twos. The 1.7-ish is the radical three. So in the direction of zero, I'm going to go 1.7-ish. So like in this neighborhood. In the direction of 30, I'm going to go 2.8-ish, so almost three. In the direction of 90, I'm going to ignore that. In the direction of 180, I'm sorry, uh, 150, I'm going two radical two. So again, 2.8-ish. So almost three, so something in this neck of the woods. Then rad three in the direction of 180 degrees. It doesn't look like that's closing the loop. All right, so I have this. I mean, it's something, but I think I need more, right? So now I have two possibilities. I can continue, right? Looking for nice numbers around the unit circle. So next up would be 210, 270, 330, and 360. So we can do it that way, just continuing the process and see what it comes up with, right? So we know the angles are 210. And if that doesn't, get us a clearer indication of the picture, then we'll start filling in the blanks. Okay. So 210. Gives me a two radical two. So about 2.8-ish in the direction of 210. All right, 270. Non-real, so ignore it. Three thirty. Two rad two. So in the direction of 330, we're going out almost three. And then 360. Back to radical three. So in the direction of 360, we're going radical three. Well, we already have that. All right, that's the same as going zero degrees. All right. So what we actually have here, and if you don't recognize it, well, we definitely haven't gotten to this topic in this course. But that being said, it's you know something that you may have seen before. This is actually the graph of a hyperbola. Right. So if I connect, basically a hyperbola looks like two opposing parabolas. Right. So it's a discontinuous graph where you have opposing, they're not really parabolas, but they sure look like them, right? Two opposing what look like parabolas, right? And so that's what we're ending up with here. And there is a rectangular component, a rectangular counterpart, I should say, to this equation, right? Um, counterpart, counterpart. I think that's one word. If not, that's fine. Counterpart is our fourth word of the day, counterpart as in my counterpart in the social studies department is professor social studies. I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know who my counterpart would be, right? Uh, so, yeah. Oh, you know, like the counterpart to the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars in Star Trek might be considered the USS Enterprise. I don't know, I'm just looking for different ways to say counterpart. So we have simple looking graphs, like really simple, get a little bit more complicated, and then they become disastrous. Uh, not really, I mean, it's still based off the same skills, but if you don't know going in what you're looking for, it can be a little trickier. Um, as far as 
the graphs for seven and eight, actually five, seven, and eight, All right? The circles, they're actually pretty easy to, uh, to, to write equations for in polar coordinates. In rectangular coordinates, remember, that circle we drew for number five would be x squared plus nine, uh, y squared is equal to nine. If I wanted to plot that without knowing anything about polar coordinates, I'd have to plot y equals the positive square root of nine minus x squared and y equals the negative square root of nine minus x squared, right? I'd have to plot two different functions in order to come up with that same graph. Whereas here, all I have to do is plot r equals three, right? So one form is definitely much simpler than the other. We do want to get to a point where we could actually convert back and forth between the two. So looking at page 13, I have the recalls at the top. I mean, we only just learned about them in the beginning of this class, so not really too far back to recall. But, uh, but these are the formulas that you would use to convert not just coordinates, but also entire equations from one, one system to another. So looking at number 11, x is equal to r cosine theta. So I'm going to replace every x with an r cosine theta. y is equivalent to r sine theta. So I'm going to replace every x with an r sine theta. So r cosine theta minus 4 squared plus r sine theta squared is equal to 16. All right. Now, it requires a little distributive property. This is the same as saying r cosine theta minus 4 times r cosine theta minus 4. So a little double distributing coming your way. You'd have r squared cosine squared theta. The outers, negative 4 r cosine theta. The inners, negative 4 r cosine theta. And then when we multiply the last ones together, we get a positive 16. Then I throw on at the end here, r squared sine squared theta, and I leave the 16 alone. All right, we can combine some terms. So I'm gonna take these two terms and write them adjacent to one another. So r cosine squared, oh, sorry, r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta. Then I'm gonna combine these two because they're like terms, so negative 8r cosine theta plus 16 is equal to 16, all right? So aside from being able to combine some like terms, the only thing that we could actually do that's kind of nice is we could cancel the 16s, subtract them from both sides, but we could also factor out a GCF of R squared, all right? So R squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta minus 8r cosine theta is equal to zero. We have an identity is equal to one. So this becomes r squared minus 8r cosine theta is equal to zero. I have a common r that can be factored out. r times r minus 8 cosine theta is equal to zero. Just like any quadratic, you set each factor equal to zero and solve. So I'm gonna say r equals zero and r minus eight cosine theta is equal to zero, which gives us r equals zero and r equals eight cosine theta. Now we're actually gonna to toss the r equals zero. And the reason for that is if you had x equals zero when you're doing this with quadratics, you would actually keep it because that represents a location where, where the x value is equal to zero. It's a location. 
this is a radius. If you have a circle with a radius of zero, it's not a circle. It's nothing. It's not even it's not even the pole, really, because the pole is already there. It, like you wouldn't plot anything. Right. So this doesn't account really for any aspect of this equation. The only thing that's relevant is the eight cosine theta. Now you might have recognized that this shares a similar structure to two of the examples that we did on the previous page. Right. So the equation here is a circle with center of four comma zero and a radius of four, all right? But this would be really tough to graph on a calculator. You'd have to solve for Y, I mean, it's not gonna be pretty. This is much easier to plot on a calculator because it's very simple, R equals eight cosine theta, all right? This shares a similar structure to number seven and eight, both of which were circles. All right. So we can take if, you know, it kind of makes sense that if you have a circular coordinate system, the easiest thing to graph should be a circle. If you have a rectangular coordinate system, the easiest thing to graph should be a rectangle, you know, horizontal and vertical lines. All right. So if you try to graph something that is angular, you know, like, uh, like an absolute value function or just a, a line, you know, two lines in a polar coordinate system, it's going to be trickier than plotting it in a rectangular coordinate system. And uh, by the same token, if you have a circle equation, it's going to be easier to plot in a circular coordinate system than it is to, to plot it in a rectangular coordinate system. All right. Uh, number 12, I'm going to throw a star on. Number 13, actually 13 through 16 are kind of a payoff for the graphs that we did on the previous page. Going from rectangular to, co um, to polar coordinates, it, it's typically easier in the beginning than, than going the other way around because all you're doing is replacing every X with an R cosine and every Y with an R sine, right? It's everything that happens after that that's kind of tricky because you got to do the algebra. In the case of going from polar to rectangular, it's a, an ugly substitution early on, but it cleans up very quickly, all right? So you look at the rules at the top, we have R is equal to the square root of X squared plus Y squared. So I can replace any R with that. And I also have a cosine theta. I don't see a rule for cosine theta, but if you think back to a couple pages ago, I mentioned that one thing that you could do is solve this equation for cosine theta. Cosine theta is equal to X over R. Sine of theta is equal to Y over R. That was a step I did before we found the inverse functions or inverse relations, all right? So my first move here is gonna be to replace the cosine with an X over R. All right, so I'm going to replace this with an X over R. I still have the R equals one half times, all right? Now I'm going to do a little algebra before I make my substitution for R, because I don't want to, I got R in multiple places. I don't want that ugly radical there. Uh, something else to keep in mind is we got this from the relationship that X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. So I can replace any R squared with an X squared plus Y squared, all right? So if I can somehow put these two together, that would work. Let me clean it up a little bit first. We have R equals X over two R, cross multiply two R squared is equal to X, now I can replace the R squared with an X squared plus Y squared. And that would be equal to just X. I could also distribute the two, two X squared plus two Y squared equals X. 
Now it said to get it in rectangular form. Once you have X's and Y's, it's in rectangular form, all right? So you're, it's mission accomplished. You don't have to go any further, all right? But sometimes you wanna get an idea of what this will look like if you, if you went further. That's a different story for a different day because we have to, we have to, the whole topic on conic sections where we do that sort of thing, all right? For now, our ultimate goal is to get it in terms of X's and Y's and, and we did, all right? You could also write it as, if I divide both sides by two, x squared plus y squared is equal to one half x. You do it that way also, but as long as it's just x's and y's. All right. One more, looking at number 15. This is one that we did not graph, but I want to show you what it would look like in rectangular form. So I can factor out an r, and I'm going to have one minus sine theta equals zero, All right? Now, when you solve a quadratic and, you know, anytime you have something that you could factor and set equal to zero, you're treating it like a quadratic. I'm going to take R, set it equal to zero. And we learned earlier that that's irrelevant. We toss that because a circle with a radius of nothing is nothing at all one minus sine of theta is equal to zero. If I solve this for theta, let me make a better looking one there, I can add a sine of theta to both sides. All right, so sine of theta is equal to one. If I want theta alone, I have to take the inverse sine of both sides of the equation. All right, so I'm gonna apply an arc sine to both sides. I'm gonna pop in the sine of theta. And this is one of the reasons why we learned about inverses, right? Okay? Because we, we know that we could use this as a technique. Arc sine of sine is equal to theta. That's how we know they're inverses arc sine of one is equal to 90 degrees or pi over two, All right? It sounds like we're solving for X here, but if you think back to this example, we had theta equals something that corresponded to a line, All right? So what's happening here is we're looking at the polar equivalent to a, a line that goes up to 90 degrees and then you know in the opposite direction. This is the same as x equals zero or the y-axis. Right. Now it's possible you look at it and say, well, okay, um, I didn't see that. So you would continue on and say, I have theta is equal to 90 degrees. I have a rule for theta. The, the convenient one that involves both an X and a Y is inverse tangent of Y over X. So I would replace the theta with an inverse tangent arc tan of Y over X. That's equal to 90. And then I would apply the tangent function just to get Y, y over X alone, get rid of the arc tan. I would apply a tangent to both sides. So the tangent of the arctan of y over x would just be y over x. The tangent of 90 degrees just making sure oh, my penmanship is a disaster here. Nah, I'm just going to rewrite it. Uh, I need arc tan. All right. When you find the tangent of 90 degrees, that's equal to sine of 90, which is one, over cosine of 90, which is zero. All right. So again, tangent is sine over cosine. 
Now I'm actually writing it out this way because otherwise I'm going to say it's equal to undefined. It's like I don't have an answer. That's not the case. When I cross multiply here, I get X equals zero. All right, X times one, Y times zero. All right, so it all comes down to Y. And it's actually a lot of, a lot of background work required for something this, I'll call it simple. Uh, simple, not easy. All right, because you say it's simple, you think well, he thinks this is easy. It's not. It's more like it's a simple answer and a really, really kooky approach to get you there. All right. That's why I brought up this because if you recognize what theta equals 90 degrees means, then you could save yourself from having to do all this stuff. All right. So that's where we're going to leave it for tonight because we definitely need some time to digest this before we work on classical curves. Um, I'm going to start off next class by going over the ones I skipped. So I got these problems here and the graph on the previous page. So all three of these and the graphs on the previous page. And then we'll get into what's called classical curves. I mean, none of these look like circles, so they're a little bit more uh, interesting. All right. And then that'll kind of put a ribbon on the polar part of this unit. So we touched on law of sines, law of cosines, vectors, now polars. And then we have to, we have to touch on uh, conic sections before it's all over, right? So we're getting there, but you can see how all the stuff I've been talking about along, all along the way, like unit circle, like knowing that stuff, it's really coming in handy now, right? And if you don't know it, then you really would see how it would, be, it would be useful. You'd be like, well, if I only knew that, I knew what the heck he was talking about. So one of your priorities should be to take some time to re-familiarize yourself or just familiarize yourself with the unit circle. And, um, and it'll go a long way, I promise. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording.